Next, I'm going to talk about a best practice from my home country, from Austria, where we have worked on a checklist for health professionals. A little bit uh, um, different from the clinical guidelines, and I'm going to uh, explain to you how we got there and how a patient organization can really make an effort to improve the quality of care in their countries. Because as you know, our health care systems in European countries differ quite a lot. We have health care systems that are organized centrally, like France. We have uh, uh, health care systems in countries like Austria or Italy, which are organized totally differently in regional groups, like federalistic approach, and also in terms of um, you know, the, the, the treatments and the services that they offer differ a lot. So it makes it's important to also have a clear understanding what can be offered in your own country. So I'm the founder of, um, of the Austrian patient organization NF Kinder, and in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I chose to become a patient advocate and what we did to improve health services in Austria for NF patients. So I have a daughter, her name is Rhea. She was diagnosed at a young age of seven months with NF1. And this really changed our lives as parents. Those of you who have children yourself understand health becomes the most important thing in life when you get children. To then hear from the doctors, your child is affected by a rare disease called NF1. There is no cure back then. There were no treatments available, which luckily has changed. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just devastating. And then at the age of two years, she developed bilateral optic pathway gliomas, which threatened her eyesight. So uh, she had to start with the chemotherapy for 18 months uh, at the age of two and a half years. So we spent a lot of time in the hospital. Um, and she also had to do a brain surgery because two other gliomas appeared even during the chemo and uh, started to um, block the liquids from the brain to flow back to her spine. So it was quite a challenging time for us as parents, but also a very inspiring time because I witnessed my daughter go through all these challenges often with a smile on her face, always optimistic, always thinking about others and how she can make, you know, bring joy to the life of others, how her roommates, the doctors, drawing pictures for them. And I thought to myself, if my daughter can do this, I can try to start a patient organization. And that's what I did after the, patient, uh, after the chemotherapy ended. Today, Rhea is doing very well. She's an active young lady doing sports. Uh, you wouldn't believe that she has gone through all this. Uh, she's skateboarding. She's uh, yeah, just uh, our, our angel. <laughs> well, as I said before, NF1, the disease with a thousand, many, thousand faces with so many uh, manifestations, tumors, Bone, uh, bone manifestations, neuropsychological issues are very common, cardiovascular issues, epilepsy, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, I can't even show everything. But doctors in medical school, they don't learn enough about rare diseases like NF. It's just a short little chapter in their, in their uh, you know, school books. So NF experts are really rare. Um, so in Austria, uh, the doctors who looked after NF patients, they were not connected to each other. They were not talking to each other. And, and the patients and the caregivers, they were not aware of the few, uh, um, the few experts uh, uh, that are in Austria. They didn't know where to turn to. Guidelines back then were missing. And there were very different approaches in how to look after NF patients. So one doctor was using a totally different approach than another doctor. And if a family was seeking advice, they would hear different things and were totally confused. So without guidelines, without uh, you know, uh, checklists for doctors, there's a high risk of mismanagement yeah, and even a uh, bad consultation for the patients. So that was obviously one of our goals as a patient organization. So again, in Austria, I use the same uh, uh, image like before. Oh, sorry. Um, so we, we had basically nothing when we started. There was no dedicated center of expertise that looked after the NF patients. There was no active patient organization. It was really difficult to find information. 
Um, there were no awareness campaigns. Doctors didn't have any possibility to uh, participate in educational programs in Austria. There was no network. Patients, families didn't have any psychosocial support. There was no clinical research happening in Austria. Yeah, and we as a patient organization also had to start from zero. We didn't have a single cent as budget. So it was again like a desert, nothing was there. But luckily, there was a department for neuro-oncology at the Pediatric University Clinic in Vienna who had a lot of expertise because the head of this department used to work in the US with one of the main NF experts and gurus, uh, Professor Bruce Korf, and she learned a lot over the overseas and took that knowledge back to Austria and was then educating her doctors uh, about NF. And because brain tumors are quite common in NF1 patients, about 20% of children with NF1 will develop brain tumors, they saw a lot of those patients because they are specialized in children with brain tumors. So they said, okay, we're going to look after NF patients as well, but they didn't have a dedicated apartment. Time was always short. The waiting list for an appointment was very long, at least three months. Yeah, we also had a, a genetic uh, um, a genetic, geneticist in uh, the western part of Austria, Professor Wimmer from the Medical University in Innsbruck, who was doing all the genetic diagnosis for NF. And also there was a basic scientist, uh, Klaus Schefzek, also from Innsbruck from the Biocenter, who dedicated his uh, career uh, to investigate the protein neurofibromin, which is not properly working in NF1 patients. So there was something there, and again, we felt like it needs some water, and maybe we can provide that as a patient organization. So what did we do? Well, first, uh, we said we cannot do this alone. Um, we are, we're not health professionals. We're patients and, and parents. We need to work with the specialists and the experts. And we need to make them realize that we have common goals. So the Medical University of Vienna have three main pillars in their vision, which is research, education, and patient care. As a patient organization, we can 100% identify with you know, these pillars. That's exactly what we want to achieve as well. So there's a win-win situation. So let's look at those different pillars and start with patient care. Our vision was to have a dedicated center of expertise for NF patients in Austria, where patients can receive diagnosis, counseling, uh, where they get routine care, not only medical care, but also, very importantly, psychosocial support and care, and where they can receive state-of-the-art therapies. So, in 2017, we started negotiating with the Medical University Clinic. Uh, it took about one year and it went really through all the different levels in that uh, organization. Uh, but then finally, uh, they signed an agreement, a, a collaboration contract. And in 2018, we were able to provide the necessary funds to hire the necessary additional staff to have a dedicated department for neurofibromatosis patients. And that opened in 2018. It's open two days per week where we see patients. So now if a patient uh, has an urgent matter, needs to be seen quickly, it doesn't take three months, they can come, on, uh, come in really in a couple of days or even immediately. We look after 300 pediatric patients from all across Austria. Austria has a population of about 9 million people. So we believe that's almost half of the uh, pediatric patients in the whole country. We have regular NF board meetings. Uh, An NF board meeting looks like this. We assemble the different specialists from our hospital, which are oncologists, neurologists, um, neurosurgeons, plastic surgeons, psychologists, radiologists, and they discuss complex cases because you really need this multidisciplinary approach to look after NF patients. It's not one doctor who can make uh, the right decision. You need the, the knowledge, the brains of all the different experts. 
And these NF board meetings are open to doctors from all across the country. So a doctor in a very western part of Austria can join these board meetings online and present his case of a patient that he's looking after, where he ha might have a, a, a question. So he can use the expertise of our center and to realize what do I do with this patient. Can I provide treatment here where I am or do I need to send it to our center of expertise because maybe a very complex surgery is needed. And complex surgeries are not done everywhere, not done in small clinics in the rural areas. So the outcomes are always better if you perform these procedures in the big clinics where they have better experience. Better experience means better outcomes. Also, our center of expertise became a member of the European Reference Network Genturis, which is again allowing us to be connected to experts all across Europe, changing, uh, exchanging expertise and uh, receiving advice, but also participating in clinical guideline development, for example. So this is how the setup looks like. You can see our head of our, of our center, Professor Amadeo Azizi, uh, talking to a father and his son who is affected. The woman on the right is not the mother, it's a psychologist. So at every doctor's visit, there's a psychologist present. The time for our meetings is 45 minutes. 45 minutes are needed to explain all these complex things to the families. So they might have just done an MRI and they want to discuss the outcomes of their MRI. So this takes time. If we see a patient for the very first time, for example, they just have done genetic testing and realize that their child has NF1, we book two slots for them. They have one and a half hours. That's really, I think, ex exceptional if you compare it to the everyday care you receive somewhere, where you have just a couple of minutes to talk to the doctor. This is not, this is not sufficient for rare disease patients like NF patients. We uh, hire uh, part of the necessary staff, as I said before. We pay for a half-time uh, position of a doctor. We pay for two part-time positions of psychologist. We pay for a part-time position of a social worker that really is necessary to take good care. Here you see a psychologist working with a young girl with NF1. And what she's doing, she's doing a neuropsychological assessment. We can offer these type of assessments to all pediatric patients who are seen at our clinics for free. We start doing this in preschool age because at the age of four or five years, you can already find out a lot about their cognitive levels. Are they maybe delayed in their development? Do they have any impairments with learning or with attention? Because we know that 40% of NF1 patients have ADHD, for example. 10% have autism spectrum disorder. So it's important to know this before a child enters school. Because if you know this, you can, uh, you can make the proper support available to this child and this will make a huge difference for the school careers. If this is not known, what parents hear back from the teachers in school is, your child is stupid, your child is lazy, your child should go to a special needs school. Well, this is not the case. So we do this at preschool age, we offer it again during primary school uh, before there's the next change in the school system and we also uh, offer it at high school age. So that way we were able to build one of the world's largest longitudinal pediatric cohorts where we have different data points and can really make sure to understand, have a better understanding of the neurocognitive issues in NF1 patients. Let's talk about research. So we provided the initial funding for a psychological research project that really made this, all these neuropsychological assessments possible uh, in 2016. And since then, we have been working uh, with uh, you know, the psychologist uh, and generated a lot of data. Um, also, we were able, through our initial funding, that the medical university could apply for a grant, which they won, and it was the largest grant that our medical university has ever gotten for a psychological uh, project. So it really means, again, creating a win-win situation. Without our initial funding, this wouldn't have been possible, so they were very pleased with this. 
several publications uh, were uh, uh, produced since we started the NF Kinder Center of Expertise. We were also involved in works uh, of the RAINS group. Just yesterday I received an email that uh, a core outcome set for continuous nerve fibroma has been published in one of the best dermatology journals uh, um, out there. Yeah, and this year in 2023, we finally managed also to connect to the basic scientists in our clinic and we started the first research project called Tackle NF1, where we as a patient organization are a partner. Yeah, these are just some of the, of the works that have been done uh, in our center. We have a very uh, high focus on uh, um, optic pathway glioma. Yeah, let's, let's switch to the third pillar, education. So we started to organize a scientific NF symposium uh, in 2017. We do this every two years. As I said before, there was no educational programs available in Austria. So we uh, do a full day conference for healthcare professionals, not only doctors, but we really welcome psychologists therapists, nurses, because all of them need to be educated about NF. We also grant uh, educational credits. In Austria, they are called DFP points, so every doctor needs to collect uh, those credits every year. We invite the leading national and international specialists as speakers, and we provide networking opportunities. We have a joint dinner in the evening, and we discuss opportunities for future collaborations. Um, yeah, and also we really try to educate young doctors, young psychologists, uh, and uh, people under the age of 30 from healthcare professional backgrounds uh, don't have to pay anything to participate in these meetings. Because we believe that, you know, the young researchers, the young doctors of today might be the ones who will develop the, the future breakthrough, maybe even a cure. Yeah, this is just one example of our, uh, of our symposium. Uh, the, 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 the gentleman with the microphone in his hand is Professor Pierre Wolkenstein, one of the leading NF experts uh, in the world, a dermatologist from Paris. On the left next to him, you cannot see her face, that's J. Shree Blakely from Baltimore, from, from the US, also one of the leading NF specialists. Uh, yeah, and it's really great that we can provide this uh, and share knowledge with uh, the Austrian uh, healthcare professionals. We used this opportunity of assembling all these experts in 2021 to kick off the Austrian NF network. So we made an effort to invite uh, the people who look after NF patients from all over our country and said, we want to work with all of you. We need to talk, we need to be connected. Um, and we really initiate, initiated this as a patient organization. Um, and this is an open network where health professionals from the whole country can join. We currently have members in eight out of nine Austrian states. And we discussed in this kickoff meeting, what can we do? What's, what's important? What shall be our first project? And we decided and agreed that we should harmonize and elevate care standards in Austria by developing an Austrian care plan for pediatric NF1 patients. And this is how we did it. So we kicked off at this kickoff meeting in November 2021. We discussed about the scope, uh, the time plan, the methodology that we're going to use. Uh, we had the development phase that went from January 22 to January 23 where we co-developed this together with doctors and patient experts. Uh, we had regular online meetings that we organized and, and uh, coordinated. Uh, we produced a, a draft and then we had a refinement phase where we get additional feedback, broader feedback. We presented uh, these drafts in scientific meetings uh, and yeah, and the Austrian care plan for pediatric NF1 patients will now soon be published in the, in the next coming weeks. Um, and it will then be uh, disseminated through medical journals, of course, through our uh, channels, our website, uh, our social media channels, through medical societies um, and at scientific meetings. 
And we believe that this is important also for all the patients, all the caregivers to have this, to know, okay, this is what the doctors should do when they look after me or my child. In parallel, we also started to develop the same thing for adult patients. So the first uh, previous slide was about uh, pediatric patients, and then this year in February, we started to work on a, uh, a care plan for adult NF1 patients. As you can see, it took less time because we could build on the methodology and on the structure that we have developed for the pediatric, pediatric care plan. And there's differences uh, when you look after adults with NF1. They have different issues. They have a risk of malignancies like MPNSDs. They have a, female patients have a risk of breast cancer. So this needs to be known by every doctor. So yeah, and this was the kickoff meeting at first, development phase, refinement phase. Also this work is finalized now and will be soon published, hopefully within the next weeks. And again, we will develop this and, and disseminate this through all channels possible to make sure everybody has this. Um, and well, you can break it down basically on one sheet of paper. It's just one sheet of paper that tells the doctors what to do. It's really a checklist. So as you can see, uh, it's, it's, we have different sections. Clinics, what the doctors need to look at when they see a patient in their clinic. Laboratory work, like the blood work that you need to look at. Radiology, like MRIs that need to be done. Um, uh, other, other, uh, other areas like ophthalmology, orthopedic uh, uh, screenings, neuropsychological diagnostics. But also we have here in this care plan um, the link to the patient organization. So all the doctors who look after NF patients, they need to tick the box, yes, I have informed the patient that there is a patient organization, I have provided informational material to that patient, to that family. Uh, yeah, I think it's very comprehensive, it's easy to use. The doctors just need to tick the boxes to make sure that they provide the best possible care for their patients. And we believe that through that we will really elevate the level of care in Austria. And since, and since all, uh, you can see on top, all, all the medical universities in Austria have been a partner in this, and several regional clinics have also been a partner of this. So I think if you show this to a doctor, he would have a very hard job of saying, okay, but I'm not following these, uh, these uh, uh, recommendations, I'm doing my own thing. No, I think he would really be very glad to know that this has been a consensus um, you know, uh, decision of all these clinics. Um, yeah, and of course we also um, uh, use the Genturis guidelines when it comes to tumors to make sure that we are following what has been agreed on on a European level. Yeah, so the take home messages for me would be for you that patient organizations can initiate NF networks for clinics. Sometimes it needs you as patient organizations to spearhead something like this because Many doctors are overworked, overwhelmed with work, and don't have the time always to network and reach out to each other. So patient organizations can also initiate and co-lead the development of care plans. I'm happy to share, of course, our Austrian care plan with anyone interested. Um, patient organizations can help that way to improve health services and therefore also the quality of care. And as we have seen before in the previous talks, patient organizations can be involved on so many uh, levels. Uh, developing clinical guidelines, setting up clinical networks, uh, like we said in the EU Pearl project, uh, contributing to clinical trial protocols, um, helping to recruit patients for studies, organizing scientific meetings, and many more. So, yeah, we need active patient organizations in every country to make sure that we have better quality of care and uh, better research.